Okay, last panel of the day. You guys ready? Woo! Uh, that wasn't loud enough. I'm not good at this. I can't do that. Yeah, all right. Now we're talking. Um, again, my name's Casey. I'm from Future Music Coalition. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's been an amazing day, and we're really glad that you're here to uh, experience it with us. When we were thinking of putting together a panel on licensing, we found ourselves in the not unfamiliar position of having to present a pretty complex set of issues in a way that's like marginally comprehensible. Um, we like a challenge. Oh, no. <laughs> um, with digital technology and music, there's no shortage of issues to discuss, but we thought it would be interesting to look at one particular flavor of music licensing, which is called the blanket license, and talk about how or whether it fits into today's music marketplace. Uh, we all want these structures to work the best they can, basically so musicians can get paid. And before we get started, uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that we had some basic definitions down. Uh, music rights can be really confusing in general, but if you do want a good primer, I suggest that you grab one of these handy little booklets that one of our panelists, Jeff from TuneCore, uh, put together. Jeff, did you bring those and, and lay them out anywhere in the world? We ship them ahead of time, yes. If not, then no. Right. They're also available online at tunecore.com slash copyright. Anyway, uh, they, they cover, this covers all the exclusive rights that come when you create a piece of music and how you get paid for each one within corresponding use environments. Uh, the one we'll be talking about the most today is the right to public performance. And remember, there are two copyrights in music. There's the underlying composition, which is basically the notes on paper. Uh, and there's also the sound copyright, which is music captured on some sort of medium like tape, hard drive, uh, vinyl, uh, wax cylinder, um, for anyone who's into wax cylinders. And the public performance right is what allows songwriters and publishers to get paid when music is played on over-the-air radio. And there's also a digital version of that right, which applies to digital broadcasts like Pandora, like internet and satellite radio, as well as cable and TV music channels that play music but not video. You guys confused yet? No, you guys are too smart for that. Um, back when radio was first starting to become a thing, there was a real concern about paying songwriters and publishers when DJs played a song. In those days, it would have been impossible to individually license every single use with all the different rights holders. So the industry arrived at what's called a blanket license, which allows broadcasters to play whatever music they wanted, uh, so long as they paid a certain fee to the rights holders through performance rights organizations, or PROs, who would then distribute the money to the songwriters and the publishers. Now this system is probably what uh, you know, helped radio grow and the songwriters and publishers got a piece of that revenue. But the performers and labels didn't get paid for over the air broadcasters and they still don't. But in 1995, Congress established the digital public performance right which compensates performers and labels when music is broadcast in the digital environment. Like I mentioned before, webcasting, satellite radio, etc. This is as clear as a bell. Is it? Good. Um, the organization that handles collecting money and paying rights holders in that environment is called Sound Exchange. Now, we're going to dive right into this because uh, I don't want to hear myself talk all day as much as I, I love to. Um, we're in a per play access environment uh, to a large degree with music, and some people have raised questions about whether the blanket license still makes sense. Other people would say there's a case for actually expanding it to other uses, like interactive streaming services where you can, where the listener gets to choose the song that you want to hear. Uh, at FMC, we're really basically concer concerned with one thing, how do musicians and songwriters get paid? But we also want to look over the horizon and see you know, what the licensing landscape is going to look like in the coming years. So we've assembled this super genius panel uh, that can examine these issues from all kinds of different angles, and I'm just going to try to keep up. So I'd like to take a few moments now to have the panel briefly introduce themselves before we get into all the mind-melting stuff. Maybe we can start way, way over with David. My name is David Tuvey. I'm an assistant professor at Washington and Lee University. Uh, my name is Jeff Price. I ran a label called Spin Art Records for about 17 years. I helped to write the original business plan for eMusic and started a company called TuneCore about six years ago. I'm Gary Greenstein. I'm an attorney with the Silicon Valley based Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. And prior to joining Wilson Sonsini, I was the general counsel of Sound Exchange, worked at the RIAA, and also represented Universal Music Group. So I've been on both sides of these issues. Uh, my name is Colin Rushing. I'm the current general counsel of Sound Exchange. I've been there for about uh, three and a half years. Um, 
general counsel since June. Have Since I've been there, I've focused on rate setting, enforcement, compliance, other regulatory issues. My name is Patricia Pollack. I'm a lawyer with the firm of Brett Hoff and Kaiser in Washington. We're general counsel to the American Federation of Musicians, um, and I sit on the AFM seat uh, on the board of Sound Exchange. And I was around in 1993, 1994, 1995 when the Digital Performance Rights Act was passed. Great. Uh, the first question I want to ask you guys is uh, something that David actually brought up uh, to me earlier when we were emailing around. Uh, what differentiates a blanket license from a non-blanket license? For example, nowadays rights holders regularly, regularly provide huge, you know, large catalog uh, uh, for a single fee or rate, but those licenses are different than, for example, the statutory license that uh, SoundExchange uh, facilita you know, facilitates. So what are, what are we talking about when we use the word blanket license? I'll take it first because whatever I say, David's going to disagree with from the academic perspective. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we start with what is, a, what is called a statutory or compulsory license, which just means it's a license granted by an act of Congress, which compels a copyright owner to license their copyrighted work to a user who agrees to abide by the provisions of the statute and any implementing regulations. So that's a statutory or compulsory license. A blanket license, the way most people refer to it, means that within a certain class of work, whether it's a musical work or a sound recording, you are granted the right to do a specific thing with respect to that work. So a blanket license under Section 114 of the Copyright Act gives you the right to make digital audio transmissions of sound recordings on a non-interactive basis for any sound recording lawfully released in the United States with the consent of a copyright owner. So it's blanket in the sense that it covers all lawfully released sound recordings, and it covers a very narrow right, which is a digital audio transmission on a non-interactive basis. David, why is that wrong? <laughs> and I'll make this organized in three ways. No, actually, I think it's good. It might be simpler. A blanket license covers a bunch of works all in a bin covered with a blanket. So it. It's, it's a bunch of different things, but all used in the same way, as opposed uh, to one work used in a bunch of different ways. Is it a Garfield blanket? Maybe. The Snuggie, I like the Snuggie. We'll be translating this into Latin later to make sure none of you understand right. this. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. How many of you are, are artists, songwriters, just so we know? Okay, forgive me for this. I'll take two seconds. When you write a song, you get other royalties. They're different. And one of those rights has to do with the public performance. No other entity in the world is allowed to publicly perform your song but you, unless they get a license. Think about that for a second. So someone covers your song, they need to get a license from you. You are the publisher, by definition, until you transfer that right to somebody else. So what you do is you hire an entity like ASCAP or BMI or CSAC to represent you for that one right, the public performance right. You get six of them, that's one of them. Blanket licensing, as described by this gentleman here and this gentleman here, is one of the ways that those organizations license your music to third parties to allow them to publicly perform your music. Every time that happens, you're supposed to get paid. That's why this is important, because the future of this industry in the music industry is streaming. Streaming means lots and lots and lots of public performances. I got a question for, for Colin. Uh, back in the old days, it wasn't feasible to track every single play on the radio uh, for the purpose of con uh, compensating the songwriters and the publishers. But now technology lets us get pretty granular with plays, uh, and we have a digital public performance, right, which you know, Sound Exchange uh, you know, uh, uh, collects money for and distributes to labels and performers. I was wondering if you can tell me a, a little bit uh, of how you see technology fitting into uh, that universe of, 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 of blanket or statutory Sure. So, I mean, one of the, um, you know, it used to be when you're dealing with blanket license, the way that the actual rights owners and performers or songwriters, since we're, when you're talking about ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, you're talking about songwriters, they get paid based on sort of, you know, some combination of sampling and a methodology yeah, that was approved by the board. Nobody knows how you get paid from ASCAP and BMI. They're not transparent. That's why blanket licenses suck. There's no transparency. Let's see, sound exchange is fantastic. There is transparency. Right. ASCAP, BMI, I'm sorry, you suck. Because these guys have no idea how much they're getting paid or why. Why can't you tell them how much they're getting paid? And that's my problem with blanket licenses. Okay, Jeff, so, so I, I'm a songwriter. A Go ahead. With ASCAP and BMI, though. No, and not a, or ASCAP, BMI, and maybe CSEC if you're lumping them in. But sound exchange does a similar administration. 
but pursuant to statute ASCAP and BMI represent songwriters and publishers pursuant to a contract. Which, a songwriter uh, has to sign up with ASCAP and BMI. A uh, sound recording copyright owner or a recording artist don't have to sign up with Sound Exchange in order to get paid their royalties. They can sign up and they get additional benefits, but they don't have to sign up in order to get paid. So that's a difference between the musical work public performance administration landscape and administration for sound recording. I'm not that, that's right. Let me. Sure what the point is that still you should know how much you're getting paid, right? Yeah, and I agree with that. And one of the benefits of being, you know, of being sound exchange and who we are, and the fact that we're administering a relatively new right in this sort of new space is we've had a chance to, frankly, rework some of the the rules. And so one of the things that we do, which just seems normal to us, is we actually pay based on what we call census reporting. And you know, no one's perfect, but it comes pretty close. You know, 90% plus of the royalties that come in through Sound Exchange are paid out based on exactly what the service played. And the services, especially the newer ones, are able, yeah, they're able to track specifically not just what sound recordings they've played, but how many, how many individual users those sound recordings were transmitted to. And for the webcasting rates, that's how the royalties are calculated. It's literally a fraction of a penny per transmission to a user and that's what we pay out. And so when an artist gets a statement from Sound Exchange, they can, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they can just do the math and get a pretty good sense of what their share, you know, what the, the number of performances of their sound recordings was on that particular service. Um, it seems normal to us. I mean, it's one of the, the beauties of being in the digital you space. You grew out of the digital uh, right. universe, you know, at post divide. So, you know, on, on one hand, I think that that original ar arrangement with the PROs and the songwriters and the publishers must have been an innovation when you're talking about trying to crack the, you know, solve the problem of radio. Uh, Trish, do you have any feelings about what the future uh, for, for these licenses are uh, with musicians and compensation? Well, I think that one of the things that has proved to be incredibly important for musicians and for performers in the 114 compulsory license, the way Gary described it, is that um, you know, in, in the wild west land of direct licensing, everybody is thrown upon their market power and uh, performers haven't necessarily done very well when they're left to their own market power to make sure that they get a fair share of what they're going to be paid. But the 114 compulsory license for digital performance that's administered by Sound Exchange, um, performers in uh, and through the, the unions in particular back in 1993-1994 said yes, a compulsory license for the uh, non for the non-interactive uses is a good thing, um, and we insist that there will be a share specified for performers, and that really did become part of the statute, and then we started to fight for the notion that the performer's share should be paid directly to the performers and not paid to them through their label. So the way um, that the license that Sound Exchange administers now, the uh, performers get 50% of the license proceeds, and the feature performer, the royalty artist gets 45% uh, of them uh, of that of of the the total amount paid goes to them directly from sound exchange as, as Colin was right. saying. So you know it's not that, held against their debt to the label or anything like that. No, no, it's non-recoupable. Goes right to them. The major labels all have agreed by contract to not recoup from that money, and they uh, the artists get it right in their hand. And then five percent goes to uh, a, a different fund that distributes it to session performers. So, you know, back in the early '90s, when people would say. You know, compulsory licenses are bad because they're going to degrade the value of music. Um, I, you know, experience from the performer point of view has been the compulsory license is great because it's meant we've gotten actual real dollars in our hand. Um, and it's kind of invaluable. It's real And it creates an environment where you actually have po possibly more leverage. Jeff, you're all about leverage for, for artists. What do you have to say to that? Well, I, I want to point out, just so we can make sure we're communicating clearly, if you get a stream of a song on Pandora, Okay, that's called a, a non-interactive, and it falls under digital transmission. There's literally, if it goes through sound exchange, just three royalties being paid. One to the entity that controls the recording of the song, that's usually the record label. The second is going to the lead performer. Actually, there's a small percentage going to studio musicians as well. Right. And then there's the person that wrote the song. It could be a whole different person, right? And the person that wrote the song tends to be a blanket license, as we're describing it, through the PROs and sound exchange. Do you guys consider sound exchange uh, to be blanket licensing as well? 
Is that, are we I using that terminology? I consider PRO, am I wrong? I've always I'm not, I'm just, but uh, the differentiation is, as we sit here and discuss the leverage points that someone has to negotiate rates, how are they supposed to negotiate a rate if there's no transparency in what somebody else is negotiating on their behalf? Okay. So, um, I mean, I would just say in term, the, the one difference for sound exchange is that, um, you know, the, our rates are explicitly set through this litigation process. That's right. Hmm. Now, uh, here's the problem that I have, and I'm very emotional about it, is not to do an infomercial. TuneCore does digital distribution. We do it without taking rights or revenue from the sale of the recording. So the customer base that uses us sold 400 million units of music in the past two years, and they generated $200 million off of this recording. As songwriters, they earned another 100 to $150 million. They didn't get their money. They weren't able to claim it because it went to third-party organizations where they're not registered that are in other countries or here in the United States that they don't understand. It's 100 to $150 million being given to Warner Brothers, Universal, Sony, and EMI based on their market share. Why? Part of the reason I believe is because of blanket licensing. There's no transparency. It doesn't mean blanket licensing is bad, but I don't know how to provide transparency to this gentleman in the front row or someone back there that wrote a song. Do you know every time your song streams in a YouTube video, you're supposed to be paid? Want to go ask your PRO how much? They won't tell you. You want to go get your money from mechanical royalties or public performances in Japan? You can't. There's no one to serve this new constituency of hundreds of thousands of artists who are songwriters who are labels and get them back their money. And I think that's wrong, and that's my problem with blanket licenses. Does there needs to be want transparency to in this industry. Does anybody want to respond to that? Because you know, we're not able to, unfortunately, have a you know, traditional songwriter publisher PRO here to, 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 to sort of give the counter to that, but I'm wondering if anybody can, can respond to some of Jeff's criticism. So I think across the globe, there's different levels of transparency from the performance rights organizations or performing rights organizations, because they are two classes of citizens, basically, around the rights. So I think Jeff is correct in that it's useful to have that sort of pressure. There should be more transparency around how money flows through certain performing rights organizations in the US. Um, blanket licenses, however, and the compulsory in particular, also turn on a market that might not easily be turned on, not in the sexual sense, but that makes this whole thing more Ooh. interesting. Yeah, so um, when you think of the compulsory, what it did is, you know, it's a price ceiling. It basically says if you're willing to pay at least this much, then you're in the market. So as a webcaster, I can start webcasting. And what Jeff said about songwriters, right. you actually can't say no to a webcaster willing to pay the right for the sound recording. Once they're willing to pay the statutory right, the rate that they're in, then they'd have to go license the, the other well, that, side. That's not... I'm sorry. I'm not it's, that's pretty but, straight no, but up. No, you, they have to get the public performance license as yeah, well, which could be denied to them. Yeah, okay. so they have to I, get the other there's side. A, there's an issue here. Sound exchange is subject to a statutory license, or sound exchange administers a statutory license, which means that the copyright owners can't deny a user of the right to use the music. There's nothing that says that all the songwriters in this room have to affiliate with ASCAP, BMI, or CSEC. There's nothing that stops you, Jeff, from creating a, a fourth PRO Providing full transparency. I'm glad you brought it up. That's what but, we did. Right. And, and there's nothing that, say, that says you, you can't go out to the market and start suing people for infringement, saying that ASCAP, BMI, and CSEC don't have the public performance right for the musical works that I represent on behalf of individual songwriters. Well, of course you can. And if, if that right was not granted to Pandora and they then. Uh, uh, Pandora you, doesn't have a statutory license. They cannot for perform a song work. without the public performance license. If they haven't been granted a public performance license by this gentleman right here, they cannot perform his song. Right. What I'm saying well, is. And, you and can I would have a, a suggestion. PRO. I would have a suggestion for Jeff. If he's going to start a fourth PRO for songwriter rights, if, you, if you're concerned about transparency and fairness to, to your members, then my advice to you, uh, coming from my experience as a Sound Exchange board member, is that you should set your organization up as a jointly governed organization that has uh, you know, a board with members representing all of the interests, including lots of songwriters and constituent members on your board, so that you have police on your organization to make sure that you are transparent and that you set up your structures to, um, to get good information in, get good information out, and be responsive and uh, reportable back to the people that you're going to pay. Unfortunately, that won't work because there's no transparency to compare yourself against. Right? No, I can go and show the right coming in from iTunes or from Amazon abroad with a download because a download abroad generates a public performance. And I can show you when you log in month to month how much you made on your public performance. You have an audit trail on transparency. You guys tell me, how much do you get paid from ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC when your song is downloaded or streamed in Japan? How are they supposed to compare it against anything? They don't have to compare it. That's it's right. The, it's the, it's, 
You say that we're transparent, our, our competitors are not, come with us, we'll show you how much you're getting paid. You build a big enough library of music, you can compete with them in the marketplace. Gary, uh, you said something at the beginning of the panel that kind of stuck with me. You have actually straddled a, a couple of sides of, of the digital music. Uh, you and know, I'm friends. not speaking for any side. That's, t that's <laughs> totally fine. I was wondering though, you do have a unique insight. What's easiest for the services? You know, it seems like a one-stop shopping thing is a, is a pretty good deal for somebody who wants to start a digital, uh, you know, enterprise. Statutory licensing is of a phenomenal benefit to an online, any kind of music service. If you can go to one source, if you can operate under 114 for non-interactive, if, if you could expand that to cover interactive so you didn't have to do the Spotify year and a half dance of trying to enter the U.S. market or the Mogs, the Rhapsodies, the RDOs, that would be wonderful. If you didn't have to deal with ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, and you had a statutory license for the public performance of musical works, if it also included the right to make server copies, it would be a beautiful world, and arguably you would reduce friction in the system, you could create more money flow, and then you could allow services to compete on delivering a product to the customer, as opposed to how much money they've been able to raise to pay out in advances. To Why hasn't program. that world, uh, that utopian uh, vision of digital music, appeared. Jobs. People's jobs are on the line. It's a job killing protocol. No, it, it, <laughs> it, if, if you're talking Let's about, run on that. <laughs> if you're talking about, you know, why do all four majors have accounting departments that do the same exact thing? And why does every territory in Europe have a sound exchange equivalent that all does the same thing, all funded by the same four majors? Well, it's because there are people who have jobs and they don't want to lose their jobs and people have a vested interest in protecting their territory. It's not to do what's best for the people they represent. It's, I think, for the institution. So sure. ASCAP, there, there's someone in the audience who I used to work for who talks about the fact that sound exchange was more beneficial than the three PROs because they didn't have to spend 25, 50, or $100 million a year marketing against one another. That is money that could go directly to the recipients. And if that individual wants to raise their hand, I'll, I'll acknowledge them. Uh, <laughs> John Simpson, sitting over here. That oh, is, there he if is. If you've ever heard John he talk, that was one of John's lines. And the fact is, I think it is about jobs. And people don't want to lose their jobs. The business affairs people at the record labels don't want everything to be statutory, well, 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 because what would they do? Well, Congress step in. I mean, I agree with him wholeheartedly, by the way. There's no way in hell over the next decade there's, there can't be some sort of statutory on public performance. It'll be a wild, wild west out there. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately. Will our Congress allow that? Because isn't that putting your, you know, Adam Smith smacking his hand down and regulating business? Isn't it exactly what the right says we're not supposed to do? Yeah, I think do? that's a good we point get to bring that. up. Because the tension isn't really just that. It's that, you know, if you're a service trying to launch, and I've experienced that, you need to get a broad range of licenses. A statutory or some sort of compulsory basically permits you to operate quickly and easily as long as you can pay the rate. On the flip side, however, it does essentially turn off the right of a class of rights holders to say no to something. And that's the tension. I mean, beyond the business affair, I mean, the sort of... But they don't say no so long as they get a big enough advance. Yeah, the problem is yep. they're, they're, they are there to say yes, and they're there to generate revenue. But a lot of the times, if you, if you look behind the curtain, all of those big advances that get paid to labels, are they advances for which royalties will be allocated? Mm -hmm. Do they define some of it to be a prep fee for the delivery of content that they don't have to share with artists? I mean, I, I think it's all about who's going to get the money, who's going to get that super high salary at these labels and other organizations. It's not about passing money through. It's not about the transparency that Jeff is But there is also a tension provide. in that even independent artists, DIYs, they would own all that collective of rights, right? If we, tr if we trigger a statutory, there is sort of the they can't say no to this use. And we may think from a policy perspective as a country or as a whatever, that that's good for music overall, but it does have a cost or there's sort of the expense, so to speak, in that some artists may not want to be on Pandora, but technically because of a statutory, let's say that it is on both sides, so you could just do it if you want, you know, play it if you wanted to, they wouldn't be able to in that case. And that's the give and the take with sort of turning the market on by triggering the statutory, but you're also saying to some artists, well, sorry, you can't actually say no in this scenario, with, which with for a Spotify or a radio or a MOG. Or, or Prince. Or Prince. <laughs> or, or, or Prince. Colin, Prince, I, which I, is a Minnesota yeah. thing. It's not necessarily a Prince in particular, because <laughs> right. um, they're uh, all above I have a question for Colin. Um, you know, okay, so I'm an artist, and say I'm, uh, I'm not signed up for sound exchange. What happens if my music gets played on any of the, the digital broadcast mediums? Where, where does that money go? What happens? Well, right now, so the, um, if that 
the money stays with us until you register, and there is a period of time. It's free. We we should add. Oh, yeah, you should all register right. with Sound Exchange. If you're not registered with them, it's free yeah, money. This is actually a, a nice segue. It's and thank you. And, and Jeff has done a number of great videos for us, help trying to help us get the word out. We have millions of dollars that, that are waiting to be collected. Um, we have the ability under the regulations to do what's called a pool release every three years, basically three years after a distribution. So if a, if a, if a artist uh, so sound recording is performed and we collect money for that artist and we do a distribution, we basically put it into the bank and we do everything we can to try to get that person to sign up and we try to contact the artists, we go through matching partners to try to get them to contact the artists for us, we just do all sorts of outreach, we go to festivals where uh, bands are playing, we tell, we post lists of all the bands that are playing that uh, at that festival that we owe money to and say if you know these people please send them to us, um, we hold on to the money and, um, and, and you know the, we've done exactly one pool release in our history um, the regulations give us the ability to do what's called a pool release, or what, under the regulations it talks about using unclaimed funds to offset our administrative expenses, but it's been a, a, a board policy and a company policy to do everything we can to get the money into the hands of people to whom it's owed. Thanks. Um, so there's online registration. Everybody in the room who is an artist should sign up if you're not already signed up with Sound Exchange. And you should also check uh, the website raroyalties.com um, if you've ever done any session work because that you can check on that website to see if there are recordings for which you're owed money as a session performer. So I wanted to um, sort of ask a, a difficult question. There's a lot of debate right now uh, around the idea certain publishers, for example, going direct with digital uh, services, and also digital radio making deals with labels outside of the statutory blanket license. On the other hand, we know that the blanket licenses have been an efficient way to get all the catalog, uh, and that's something that digital services, whether they're interactive or streaming services, can benefit from, from a consumer and a fan perspective. What's the future look like? Direct. Direct and digital. It's got to be, because it puts the efficiency in it. Anything that gets you your money back more quickly with transparency in an audit trail is the right thing to do. I'll go direct with Sirius. I will go direct with Sirius provided that Sirius XFM you know, uh, pays out the appropriate amount of money and the metadata matches and I can get more money back into the hands of you more quickly. If I can't, then I'm going to outsource it to somebody else I can do it. But as a simple example, and I, and I don't want to be an infomercial, there are companies that can do public performance tracking better than in the digital sector than the PROs. Trish, do you have any views on that? I mean, largely we're talking about the digital public performance right here. If we're talking about the digital public performance right, I cannot see how it's better for any of the people in this room who are artists to have direct licenses with Sirius as opposed to going uh, through the through Sound Exchange and the compulsory license. Well, I mean, because, huge because, Sound Exchange report, the, the, but that's the just a, that's money just going a through ignorant sound exchange statement because if I can get them more of their money more quickly, why wouldn't you want well, them to have that? Actually, let's let's let Trish uh, finish what she, she was going to say, though. Because the money, when, when the money gets paid through Sound Exchange under the compulsory license, artists are going to get their 45% of, of, of that money. And it's going to be there for you and it's going to get paid to you. The license rate is going to be a better rate than the, than the direct license rate that's being offered on individual license basis um, uh, from Sirius. And there's going to be more money and there's going to be more transparency and it's going to get paid out to you for art, you know, for, for the artists in the room. The many compulsory license right. is, uh, uh, you know, far and away the best way to go. In many cases you're right, but not in the case of TuneCore because my artists are the performers. They're both. And they should be able well, yeah, to get you, right, so I don't have to worry about the performance. If you, like own, if you own the rights, if you own the rights uh, to your recording, then you're going to get 95 percent. Well, geez, percent I'll get 100 percent through TuneCore, and you'll change. get it every month. So what's wrong with that, Gary? Uh, you were going to add something. Yeah, I, I, you know, there there may be a bit of confusion as well as to whether or not Jeff is talking about the public performance right for the musical work for the songwriter, Thank you. Thank you. or for the public performance right for the sound recording, and those are two different rights. And there is, it is very convenient, as I said earlier, to take a blanket statutory license and have everything you need. But if Jeff's company represents a singer-songwriter who is the recording artist, and they own the publishing rights, and they own the rights to the master recording, and they would be their, their record label and they've affiliated, if Jeff goes out and goes to Sirius or someone else and says, 
listen, I will give you bundled rights to cover both the musical work and the sound recording. You don't have to pay sound exchange. You don't have to pay ASCAP or BMI. And because I'm giving you a one-stop shop, I'll give you a combined rate that is a little bit less than what you would otherwise pay. That's a good deal for the service. It's probably a good deal for Jeff's clients because if his overhead is lower, if he's not litigating rates, he doesn't have the tens of millions of dollars in deductions that SoundExchange, ASCAP, and BMI have for all of the litigation that they're involved in, it's not a bad deal. And so there is a major benefit for that. There probably would also be a benefit for artists to have their own collective, you know, as opposed to sound exchange. Not that it's going to happen, but there's a provision in the regulations that accounts for what happens if sound exchange were to split up. And that way the labels would probably be the ones to litigate what the rates would be and incur those costs. And the artists could free ride, if that's the way the labels would describe it, but they would just get their share of the statu statutorily allocated money. So you really have to look at what rights you're talking about, how they're going to be set, who's going to be collecting, what their overhead is before you can answer that question. I wanted to quickly, uh, I'll get to you in one second, David, then we'll go for questions, but I wanted to go back to Colin real quick because we're talking now about rate setting. Uh, can you tell the audience how rates are set for, uh, for the compulsory here, and is there any way to make the process more efficient, maybe less contentious? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> there is no, a way. I actually, way. You, you know what, I mean, I actually think that the process for what it is works pretty well. I mean, if you're talking about setting a rate that covers 100% of sound recordings, and, and that's an important point, you know, one of the differences between the statutory license that we administer um, for sound recordings and the world of the musical work, PROs, is you go to sound exchange, it's 100% coverage. You go to the PROs, one, it's a negotiation, and it's with three PROs, and that gets you, you know, maybe 90, 95% of the way. It's just really a different sort of regime. In terms of how rates are set uh, for the statutory license, so they come up for renewal every five years. There are different proceedings for each of the different license types. Right now, we're in the middle of the one for satellite radio. Um, the, the statute specifies that they take two years from when they're, they're filed until when the copyright royalty judges must act. It's not two years of litigation. There's a period for, that's intended for settlement discussion. There's a period where you submit things. There's a period of discovery. Um, that's the, but that's the traditional way is the parties put in their cases. They have an opportunity to go to the judges, the copyright royalty judges who will issue a rate or they can settle, and if they settle, then the mechanism, and the mechanism, the mechanism is designed to encourage settlement. Um, you know, there is a there's an opportunity to do that. As a practical matter, settlement is often very hard um, to reach um, because the stakes can be so high. The one time that we saw um, a large number of settlements was in 2009 when Congress passed this thing called the Webcaster Settlement Act, which gave Sound Exchange broad, the broad authority to negotiate alternatives to the statutory rates that wouldn't necessarily be deemed precedential in an upcoming rate setting proceeding, which freed Sound Exchange. To, to, to enter into a number of different agreements. It was enormously successful. We did something like nine agreements that year. Yeah, um, but it's a very complicated right. process. Now, when you say discovery, I just wanted to, a you know, process of discovery, sorry. is that a process of self-discovery? <laughs> Or is sorry, that... I forget sometimes when I'm not talking to lawyers. That's, that's the process Maybe of, it is. of, of, of um, basically like diving into each other's side's documents. It's the ugly part of litigation. Right. It's, a, it's a license to print money for the law firms. Oh. <laughs> um, I, and I'd like to add something to what Colin just said that's going to sound like a digression, but it isn't really. Um, so unions, I don't know how many of you in the room have any experience with unions or in a, a, a union. Unions got started because workers found out that collective action made, made them stronger. When they acted together in a group, they had a lot more leverage in talking to their employers. The beauty of this, the licensing rate setting procedure proceedings that um, take place under the 114 license and, um, through the agency of sound exchange is that it's a place where copyright owners, both the big ones, the majors, and the independent labels, the bigger independent labels, the smaller and medium-sized independent labels, and the performers all have a voice together and we work through together and stand together in the licensing process to get the best rate 
um, that is feasible and that works for all of us. And you know, we have fights within Sound Exchange during rate setting proceedings about. We call it self discovery. <laughs> that, that, that's that the self discovery. There is self discovery. If you've ever been on a you know in a licensing meeting in Sound Exchange, you've had more self discovery than you really can shake a stick <laughs> at or can swallow sometimes. Um, but 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 there's a lot of strength and standing together and working together and licensing that way. Um, and I never thought I would sit here and compare Sound Exchange to a union, but it occurred to me as Colin was talking that in a, in a way we are, and that gives us a lot more leverage to do what is good for the community. David, you had something from a while back. Do uh, you think it's still relevant? You want to throw yeah, it out well, there? Yeah, well, hey, there is a problem, however, with how it's said, if I may surface the it's a little dust. So since there's sort of no precedent, so if you, if you do a settlement and it gets published and there's sort of a rate that everyone's agreed to, that rate that's then published can't actually be used as an input for the next sort of rate setting procedure and then it brings everybody to the room again. There's language in the settlement that basically says this was not some sort of transaction that occurred between two parties in a certain way. And that does slow down the process and sort of make it sort of seem like a market price is being set but it doesn't count. And as an ex exchange floor, like floor that, makes, that makes me uncomfortable sometimes where you have parties in a room setting a rate, coming to an agreement, they seem to like the agreement, at least you have two of the parties there, and yet the next time they go through the process again, to some extent they start over. Those rates can't be used as inputs in the next, in the next it, decision. It's really only when sound exchange doesn't want them to be used as inputs. Yeah. When sound exchange does want them to be used as inputs, they pressure them to be admissible in future proceedings, and when they don't want them, they're not, so if you look at the rates, the lower rates for what are called pure play webcasters are non-precedential. Pandora's rates, what it paid, cannot be used in a rate setting proceeding. The higher rates that the broadcasters pay, surprise, surprise, are precedential. So Colin, if he's allowed to, could inform us as to why that's the case. I wouldn't want to put him on the spot, but that's pretty fun. <laughs> or we can go to audience <laughs> questions, uh, but if yeah. you want to answer that. I know, I know well, I lots know of labor agreements is. that have, you know, where parties reach agreements and say, and this will be non-precedential or this will be experimental. It's just a way to free people up to reach agreements that otherwise they might not be able to reach. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was any secret. I mean, we viewed the, the pure play rates as an experiment. They were really a risk for, the, for, the, our, you know, for our part of the industry. Can and you define pure play for, for the audience? Sure. So the pure play rates, and, the, and, and it's essentially, it's, it's one of the rates made available under the, um, under the Webcaster Settlement Act. And the way the rate structure is set up, as Gary said, there's a relatively lower per performance floor, but it's balanced against um, a greater of 25% of the entire company's revenue, no matter what the source is. And so it is, it is as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a rate, it's really only attractive to services that are primarily, if not entirely, streaming under the statutory license. It's open to anybody who's willing to put all of their revenue into the bucket. Um, but that's why we refer to them as the pure play rates. You know, and and they, we, as in, as we were comfortable with them in 2009 when, they, when we knew that there was no risk that we were going to have those same rates taken completely out of context in an upcoming rate setting proceeding. That's the problem with the statutory license is it eliminates the copyright owner's ability to say no, which is a really powerful tool as Jeff was talking about. We don't have that ability. And so what we have to do is is that informs everything that we do in the shadow of the statutory license. It's one of the reasons, I think, I think David is absolutely right. You look at the statutory license and you talk about what's the market for statutory licensing. Well, you know what? By definition. It's, it's, it's never existed because it exists in the shadow of the statutory system. And so one of the things we have to do as, as an organization is do everything we can to protect our constituents. And so, and, and the Webcaster Settlement Act did that marvelously by eliminating these distorting effects that prevented us from being willing to take these chances. Thanks. I, 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 I just want to comment on that, that it, that's a, a great story, and I think it's an accurate representation of the way Sound Exchange needs to present that. But when you look at the facts on an experimental basis, Pandora was, or when they were going public in their S1, it was approximately 46% of their revenue was being paid out for content acquisition, which is the language for acquiring the rights to music. That was under 
these pure play settlement rates, which are 50% of the other rates that Sound Exchange was seeking in the CRB proceeding. So if Pandora did not have the ability of paying under those pure play rates and they were paying 46%, then what they would be paying is 92%. And the question is, when you, when you step back, is that scenario appropriate and are those rates still willing buyer, willing seller, fair market value rates if the most successful webcaster out there under the rates that have been established by the CRB would be paying over 90% of their revenue just for the use of the sound recording, uh, that's evidence that will not be before the judges or was not before the judges in the last proceeding. And I would contend that that's improper and probably a violation of due process for those people who are subject uh, or want to avail themselves of the statutory Was license. that lawyer terms for like, so there? <laughs> so there. It could be. I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to make one point. I mean, so the, the broadcaster rates, which, which Gary alluded to, those were also the product of negotiation. Those were rates that we negotiated with the NAB. And, so, and, and the current rates that were what we call the default rates were, were the rates adopted by the judges um, in the last webcasting proceeding are right in the same neighborhood as the broadcaster rates. And so, you know, it, it is not the case that the, the broadcaster rates are some, you know, crazy extra market rate. I mean, those were also negotiated rates. I've got a response for that, but I... So they're there, that. there? So no. There. <laughs> but the, the broadcaster rates, there was not a broadcaster witness allowed to testify as to those rates and the waivers that they were granted by the record companies because, again, there was language in in the settlement agreement that said, if you accept these rates, they're admissible and you can't testify to tell about it. So you could not have a broadcaster come in and say, we took these rates because we got these all important waivers of, of certain conditions in the statutory license. So it's only part of the story, um, mm -hmm. but you know, it's the, it's the way parties litigate. I, I kinda I mean, sound exchange is there to get Jeff, a rate as high as they can. Jeff kind of wants to do something. I, kinda, I wanna point out to the room what we're talking about. We're talking about how much money you get paid. Okay, that's what we're talking about. You don't get to say a fucking thing about it. And the question is, do you agree with that? Okay, that's part of what's going on here. That's why FMC is so important, by the way, because you should have a voice and you shouldn't understand this stuff. And it sucks and it's confusing and it's taken me 20 years and I still don't understand what the hell this guy's talking about. But I get a good sense so of there. it. <laughs> so, so there. Um, but the point to this is you need to know this. When you write a song and record it and there's a blanket license involved and you're hearing there's two types of them, one for the recording of the song and one for the songwriter. How much money do you get paid and who gets to decide that? Right? That's what we're talking about up here. And I just wanted to bring it down to that level because it, this is boring to, to a lot of us. I'm sorry, it is. I don't know about the rest of you. I, you know, I, but I fell asleep this, a while but ago. But you need to know that this stuff is important. This impacts your bottom line of how to pursue a career, how to pursue your dreams in this business. This is how you make your money. Okay? Take a moment, learn your rights, learn what this stuff is, have a voice, join FMC. Go to Sound Exchange and register. I love the fact that they want to include all of you at Sound Exchange. I am not as, um, what's the right word? I don't want to have the same utopian view of Sound Exchange. I think that's what they mean to do, but I don't think there's an equal voice in that room. I really don't. I just, how could there be? The new music industry is you. It's no longer the major record labels. Okay, you're releasing the majority of the music in the world right now, not them. You're taking over the market share, not them. And with the explosive growth of digital, public performance royalties in particular, combined with things like non-interactive, the, the recording, sound exchange stuff, that's what's going to matter, and that's what's going to hit your bottom line, and you need to know this stuff. I think it's a good uh, point, as any, to, to see if you have any questions that you want to ask them. A um, little different question. Thanks for the uh, discussion, too. As a uh, terrestrial radio station that streams or an internet station who only streams, I'm just curious what the rationale was behind the um, number of limits of play for a particular artist. I can guess, but it'd be... Yeah, I mean, I can address the... I don't know this, what the history is behind the specific numbers. Um, what, the, um, what he's asking about is something that's called the sound recording performance complement, and what it is is if you're using the statutory license, there's a limit on the number of tracks that you can play from a particular artist or off of a particular album within a set period of time. The logic is that in the digital space, if you didn't have limits, then you could easily set up channels under this new statutory license that could easily take the place of, of you know, buying records, right? And so if you had... Um, you know, a, a station that was dedicated entirely to, to playing, 
you know, I don't know, Johnny Cash over and over and over again, you wouldn't have to buy another Johnny Cash album. It would maximize the substitutional impact of the statutory license. If you want to have, if you want to focus on particular artists or particular albums, you have to get those rights from the rights owner. But if you're using the statutory license, you can't have this, you know, this you can't have an artist specific channel. It's also a problem though because if you want to offer something that is more interactive, you have to do the dance, right? You have to run and find every single license. You asked earlier like what's the future? And then the near term future is this sort of direct license world um, which we're seeing around these more interactive services where it takes them long periods of time to start up. They expend a great deal of financial energy in order to start up. And we sort of don't get the services, musical experiences as consumers or even music fans or even artists that we would enjoy. And that's sort of where this gets a little more complicated. I, I don't think the future is actually straight up direct licensing. There's a certain benefit to this sort of big, large, blankety stuff, um, either whether it's triggered by way of a compulsory or, a, or anything like that, or a minimum number of, say, collective sort of entities that can kind of make this happen more quickly. Otherwise, it, I mean, frankly, technologically, Radio, Spotify, Rhapsody, these are 15, these are 12 to 15 year old accomplishments. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have taken that long to have Spotify in your hands for free. Um, I have a question yeah. down here. Tommy? Adam's getting his exercise. I just want to uh, note his service <laughs> to the cause here. Thank you, Adam. Right. Two questions. One, doesn't the compulsory license benefit the smaller artist? more than any other, because I've heard so much about the uh, ASCAP BMI licenses that the, the big writers make all the money and the small writers don't do as well. And you know, historically, that's the big complaint. The big guys have all the juice in that situation where is in the sound exchange world, everybody gets paid the same, regardless. A, a play is a play is a play. Yeah, the other that's question, as, a, and that's the, as a recording artist, not as the songwriter, though. But the theory may still hold that You've leveled the playing field between the big guys and the little guys, and there is no discrimination, although the Sound Exchange membership agreement does reserve to Sound Exchange the right to discriminate if the board of Sound Exchange would ever agree to that, which they so far have not, at least to my knowledge. No, they still haven't. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's more than theory, Gary. I mean, it, it's, it's fact, right, that um, when, when you combine the new digital services and the census reporting, the fact is that um, small and, and mid-sized artists get a lot more money than they ever could get under uh, uh, sampling kind of reporting. Right. So it's, it's real checks to uh, small and, and breaking artists and, and mid sort of career artists that they never got before. The second part of the question is for Colin. What percentage of uh, sound, ex uh, sound exchange revenue um, is, goes to overhead versus what the PRO, the other PROs spend? And what's the total amount of overhead that the, all of the three uh, publishing PROs spend versus the total amount that sound exchange has? Just so we have some kind you of an idea. You to provide the disclaimer that he's one of your board members? No, why would I do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I mean, in the fact, I mean, so Tommy Silverman is one of our board members, and he and Trish and others what? keep a, I can you believe it? They keep a close eye on us, and they make sure that our organization is efficient. Our admin rate for 2010 was 6.9 percent. That means 6.9 percent of the the royalties that we distributed um, were used to cover our operating costs. That I don't know the specifics for the other PROs. My understanding is that they're in the neighborhood of 12 to 13 percent. You won't get them. They will not tell you globally. They will not tell you. And they collected $10 billion in 2009, and they will not tell you their rates. They won't. That's yeah. not exactly. And the other oh, it is. I've gone, I've gone society by society and asked them. I've done it in writing and via telephone. They refuse to tell us the rates. Refuse. Flat Wait, out oh, refuse. the license rates. No, the admin rates. You want to go call up GAMA, ask them what they're taking in a new media digital transmission versus terrestrial AM, FM, and if you get it right, please post it on our blog, and I'll take you out to dinner. Okay. Okay. Any of you get any hard rates like that? Dinner's on me, swear to God. Well, since we found out where John Simpson is uh, in this room, uh, Even can, can we let him ask a question? I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, ASCAP and BMI typically publish rates around 12% on collections of over 900 million. So you're talking about $108 million. That's expenses. an average. They don't. No, no. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, what happens is overseas money, which is already processed, is included in that. And basically, all they have to do is send that on 
to their members. No, that's, that's actually inaccurate. They double dip. They take, for example, JazzRack in Japan might do 125 to 20% on a public performance, pass it back nine months later to ASCAP, who takes another 3.5% before they do the 50-50 split. So it's just, there's just no transparency in this stuff. Well, and what I'm 12 and a half is a weighted average, for example, new media digital transmissions, you're looking up to 20% admin fees on that stuff. I'm just saying it's 108 million versus a sound exchange admin fee that is so much lower. Right. Yeah, sound exchange does kick ass. There is no doubt about that, and I endorse that to the nth degree. I second and that. I think it's and with that, we're going to call it a panel, <laughs> folks. Thank you so much for sticking around for this, and thanks to everybody on the panel for being so brilliant.